Institute for Social and Economic Change. Just to give a little bit of background to about our institute, uh, Patrick, this is a uh, this institute was set up uh, exactly 50 years ago, and then we are uh, now we are having this year the Golden Jubilee. Uh, this is called Golden Jubilee year, and then we have the several uh, um, activities planned for this year. So we were hoping that uh, you would be here physically with us, and then we can make uh, uh, you also the part of our Golden Jubilee uh, festivities and celebrations. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, this institute is one of the largest uh, ICSSR uh, institutes that is devoted uh, to social science research. And I know that you are uh, you have uh, you are, you are associated with Center for Development Studies in Trivandrum. And then Hari is uh, my batchmate, Hari Lal, and then uh, and uh, even uh, Thomas Isaac. And like Isaac, uh, so like CDS, Isaac is also one of the institutes. And uh, so we do um, uh, considerable work uh, on the various themes, but I think local development is also one of the important themes. And then uh, if you have uh, any questions, then we can subsequently discuss, and then I don't want to take much time. And I would like um, also to welcome um, uh, Professor Chandan Gowda, and then he's uh, RK Hegde, Ramakrishna Hegde, Chair Professor at our institute. And then I thank him for uh, taking this initiative and then um, introducing uh, Patrick to the Institute. And thank you very much, uh, Chandan, for this uh, very, um, uh, something very apt uh, thing that what he has done. And then um, uh, the topic is very apt, very close to the heart of uh, Ramakrishna Day. And then uh, uh, you must be knowing uh, Patrick, Ramakrishna Day was uh, a chief minister who introduced uh, the democratic decentralization in India. And then he was very radical. And then uh, uh, the kind of reforms that he introduced as far as decentralization are concerned, they were uh, very revolutionary for the times, uh, that time, the kind of context that India was having. And then he was very democratic in his heart. And then uh, uh, his reforms were uh, very far reaching. And then uh, his model, his model of uh, decentralization ultimately became, it is uh, by and large adopted in the same measure when we formulated uh, the 73rd uh, constitutional amendment in 1992. So the legislation that he brought out in the mid uh, uh, 80s became a kind of blueprint for us to have the decentralization um, uh, in uh, the whole of country. And in his honor, then we have instituted a, a chair called Ramakrishna the Memorial, as a Ramakrishna the chair. And then Professor Chandan Gowda is currently uh, RK the chair professor. And then this, uh, uh, he really likes this kind of topic because um, he, um, so the topic is very, very close to, would have been very close to his heart. And then uh, I also welcome uh, several of my colleagues who are here. Um, uh, uh, my senior colleague, Professor uh, Meenakshi Rati, uh, Sobin, Manjula, uh, Chandamma, and uh, Vani, and various other people. Uh, uh, so, yeah. so I also welcome Dr. Ravil Bhaya. Uh, sir, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think we have muted you, and then you cannot really say Hello to you, uh, hello to us, and then uh, I'm very happy that you, you were able to join this uh, meeting. Uh, good, good, afternoon, afternoon, sir. good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. And then we, uh, yeah. we, we also have uh, several students, uh, Patrick, um, uh, that are attending, and then they would like to present to you. And then um, now uh, with this uh, brief uh, welcome, we'd like to request and then to introduce the speaker and also the moderate uh, session. Over to you, Chandan. Thank you, Professor Rashikar. Um, uh, thank you again, Patrick, for accepting this uh, lecture invite and a warm welcome to our audience. A quick note on the annual Ramakrishna Hegde Memorial Lecture. This lecture is organized in memory of Ramakrishna Hegde, former Chief Minister of Karnataka, who, as Professor Rashikar reminded just now, showed an exemplary commitment to the ideal of ideal and practice of decentralization. The lecture series hosts distinguished individuals whose work has enriched discussions of decentralization and extended them in new directions. Um, we're truly delighted that Patrick Keller is giving the 
R.K. Hegde annual lecture today. Uh, Patrick is the Lynn Cross Professor of Social Science and Professor of Sociology and International Studies at Brown. Um, his work, which is based on field work in South Africa, India, and Brazil, has richly enhanced the understanding of how citizen population relates to local governments, of local innovations, the democratic ability of civil society, of how economic growth can be reconciled with social justice. He's authored many books. Those of you who have seen the invite will have seen the details of these books, but for those of you who have not seen the uh, bio note, his first book is The Labor of Development, Workers in the Transformation of Capitalism in Kerala in 1999. He's co-authored Social Democracy in the Global Periphery. He's written a book, Bootstrap, Bootstrapping Democracy, Transforming Local Governance and Civil Society in Brazil. And most recently, he's co-edited Deliberation and Development, Rethinking the Role of Voice in Collective Action in Unequal Societies. Um, we're truly delighted that he's as, uh, giving a talk titled Binding the Local State, State Capacity and the Democratic Deficit in India. Uh, he'll speak for about 45 minutes, following which we'll have a Q&A session. Please type in your question in the chat box. You might be able to ask them uh, directly yourself as well. We'll see how it goes. Um, Patrick, over to you. I'm sharing my screen. I just want to make sure this works. You can all see my screen? Yes, yes. So let me begin uh, by thanking uh, the director, Professor Raj Shekhar, and, and, and Professor Chandan Gowda for inviting me today. It's, it's truly an honor to be able to give this talk as the Ramakrishna Hedge Memorial Lecture. And really for two reasons, both as, as you both noted, um, the role that the chief minister played in launching uh, the initial efforts at decentralization. And then in my own um, many years of <clears throat> working on the topic of decentralization in India, I, I visited ISEC on a number of occasions. In fact, along with my colleague Ashutosh Varshni, we organized a workshop at Isaac uh, almost 10 years ago on, on urban decentralization, which is one of the topics I'll be talking about today. Um, so I've over the years learned so much from scholarship that's been produced at Isaac. And it's, it's, it's really difficult for me to think of any place where I'd rather be giving this talk than at Isaac. So thank you very much for the invitation. And my only regret is that we can't be doing this in person um, but I am uh, planning to travel to India much more uh, now that hopefully we're beyond this pandemic and uh, look forward to meeting and engaging with all of you in person. So today what I'd like to do is essentially provide you an overview of the argument that I'm developing in a book that I'm currently working on. And um, Professor Gouda provided a very lovely and, and generous uh, overview of, of my work. Um, I have indeed been working on questions of democracy and, and decentralization um, in, in Brazil, in South Africa, and in India. And, um, and I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but the big argument that I want to make today that is that the single most important challenge that uh, vibrant democracies such as Brazil, South Africa, and India uh, face today is in effect the challenge of decentralization. And in particular, of promoting decentralization as a way to bind the state, the, to make the state genuinely and, and deeply accountable uh, to uh, 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 the, the, the popular will. Um, and so this is the argument I'm going to try and develop today. It's, it's, quite, it's a bit ambitious. Um, it's quite theoretical, uh, but I, I will uh, talk about the three cases as well. And I'm really very much looking forward to your uh, feedback on this talk today. So I'll try to be disciplined and finish in 40 minutes or so so that we can have as much time for discussion as possible. Um, and I let me... Let me put my slides in uh, present mode. Um, Chandan, this, the, you can see this, right? You can see my first slide. Yes, yeah, clearly, yes. Very much. So there's, as you all know, there's a huge letter, literature on the developmental state. And I think during the 1990s, more or less, uh, there was a certain convergence in the debate. 
On the one hand, you have Joe Stiglitz, the, the famous uh, economist. And the, on the other hand, you have Peter Evans, a sociologist who's written extensively about the developmental state. Um, and the consensus essentially amounts to recognizing that development, which we, which we had long thought of as an, and theorized as a process of accumulation, a process of investment, increasingly now is being understood as a function of organization. In other words, uh, markets are most dynamic and most effective uh, when they are properly embedded, encased in certain kinds of institutions. Um, and this is the institutional turn that took place in economics in the 1990s. Um, and of course, at the center of those institutions, the meta institution, the institution that governs all other institutions within a given territory is the state. And this literature, of course, goes back to Max Weber, the, the sociologist, um, in arguing that um, not only that markets have to be embedded in institutions, but that states themselves can be active agents of transformation. And in effect, that's what the developmental state literature demonstrated empirically, namely that the state under appropriate conditions and ideally having a Weberian type bureaucracy can intervene in such a way as to accelerate the process of industrialization. Now, interestingly, Peter Evans and others have now argued that as much as that was true for development in the 20th century, where the emphasis was industrialization, it's even more so true today in an increasingly information um, and services-based economy, where the role of the state in coordinating institutions, in supporting the formation of human capital, et cetera, has become more essential than ever. This has gotten picked up increasingly in the literature. So now invariably we talk about governance, good governance as the key uh, to uh, development or sustaining uh, effective and sustainable development. Um, Atul Kohli in a recent, well, not so recent book now, but relatively recent, uh, famously argued that India is an incredibly vibrant democracy, but it's a vibrant democracy that is badly governed. And I'll be elaborating that point. The former World Bank economist, Lant Pritchett, has a lovely article where he comes up with this, I think, very evocative phrase of the, quote, flailing state. Uh, the idea being that where, while at the center, the Indian state is extremely capable um, and well-organized and populated by very Weberian-type bureaucrats, some might dispute that characterization today, but at least until recently, that might have been a proper characterization. The, the problem uh, uh, of the Indian state is that once it gets to the local level, it's flailing, that the arms and the limbs are no longer well coordinated with the center. And it's a, it's a very evocative image, and I'll say more about it. Um, and this has led um, many to argue that the problem is a, quote, chain of command problem, that the problem is that the center just can't get the states and can't get local government to act in a way that's aligned with developmental goals. And th these are the famous problems of leakage and, and corruption and disarticulation, et cetera. And so the World Bank keeps prescribing good governance. Um, and what they've done, <clears throat> I think, is as the World Bank is, is inclined to do, is give a develop a very technocratic interpretation of this problem. And I want to suggest that the problem is less a problem of a chain of command and more a problem of the chain of sovereignty. And this is where the idea of democracy comes back into the equation. Uh, namely, that it's not so much about the center giving commands and the states and local governments aligning themselves with those commands, as much as making states, which already are quite democratic, but in particular local government itself more democratic, democratic and ensuring that popular preferences are actually translated into state action. And there's really two problems here, and I'll elaborate both these points at some length. One is the idea of autonomous preference formation, and a second related problem is that of accountability from below. So let me bring democracy back into this equation. And here, I just wanna begin with a very general conceptualization of democratic deepening. Uh, India, Brazil, South Africa, these are all vibrant democracies and competitive elections. They have all the basic liberal institutional foundations of an effective democracy. 
but there are challenges of democratic deepening. And how do we conceptualize that challenge? And I wanna draw here on the work of the great sociologist, Charles Tilley, who argued quite some length over his long career that the key to democracy is shifting people's trust from networks, from their interpersonal networks to institutions. You want people to trust the institutions rather, rather than simply invest in, in personal networks. And this is a, a process that takes place over time, obviously, and it faces many obstacles. A second point, and this is a definitional point that I wanna make about democracy, is to disaggregate this idea of how power is authorized. You know, when we say a state is democratic, what we in effect mean is that its authority, its coercive and, and legal authority um, has been authorized. Um, and it's been authorized in the most obvious sense, in the traditional sense, uh, the liberal sense, through representation. So there are elections and citizens delegate uh, representatives uh, to speak to them. They are authorized to speak uh, for the people. And this is the role of political parties. And that's the sine qua non of any democracy. Uh, without uh, representative authorization, you cannot call a regime democratic. Uh, but democracies are more than obviously just representation. Uh, democracies are also founded on legal constitutional grounds uh, the, um, that, that, that um, basically govern the way in which the game is played. And this is the role of the bureaucracy in enforcing the law as it exists. And of course, the judiciary as, as interpreting the law when there are disputes. And so that's the, the second essential dimension of any democracy, it's legal constitutional forms. And then these, the first two representative and legal constitutional are essentially what in democratic theory represents the quote liberal conceptualization of, of, of democracy. Uh, but the democratic literature, of course, uh, especially in its more Rousseauian um, incarnation or what's known as the Republican tradition also emphasizes in effect the role of civil society. And this is the participatory dimension. That is you know, between elections and between the making of the laws as well as in the implementation of the laws, it's absolutely criti critical that um, citizens and civil society organizations are active, that they're empowered as citizens that they can participate in the public sphere. And this is important on many dimensions. Pratap Mehta has argued that by using their rights, um, uh, people invest in their moral worth, which in turn reinforces the use of rights. Jürgen Habermas, the famous um, German philosopher sociologist has argued that a vibrant civil society is the key to enhancing the capacity of citizens to identify their own preferences, um, to live the lives they value and have reason to value, as Amartya Sen would put it. Um, and of course, a vibrant civil society between elections uh, is, is crucial to ensuring that there are continuous mechanisms of accountability and feedback, right? So I, I don't think I've said anything new here, but I just wanna set up the basic parameters of the debate. Um, so moving on, the chat, what, is, what then is the challenge of effective citizenship? Or in other terms, the, the challenge of participatory democracy. And here, I think we can break down the question into uh, two dimensions. Um, there is, as I argue, a, a horizontal problem to begin with. Uh, that is, are all citizens equally capable, equally effective in engaging the state as citizens, as bearers of rights. Um, and this is a horizontal problem in the sense that some groups of citizens, upper castes versus lower castes, upper class versus lower class, et cetera, are more capable of, of using their rights. Um, and so we need to think about the modes of engagement. How do citizens actually engage with the state? How are politics transacted? And in engaging with the state, are, are citizens engaging as subjects, uh, which would be the non-democratic uh, version of engagement? Are they engaging as clients, which is a, a common um, dynamic in, in many competitive democracies? Or is they, are they engaging as rights-bearing citizens? So when they go to the state, when they encounter a bureaucrat or a politician, do they encounter that bureaucrat, that uh, politician, 
as a subject, as a client, or as a citizen. And here, and this goes directly to all of the work and debates that have been done on decentralization, um, here we're presented the, with the problem of what I call the surface area of the state. And this is literally posing the question of where is the state? Um, oftentimes in India, as in many other democracies, the state is actually quite far away, quite literally. Um, I did a lot of research in New Delhi um, with the, the Center for uh, Policy Research, a project called uh, uh, Cities of Delhi. And one of the things that we found that is that in slums, and in JJCs and unauthorized colonies, it's actually very difficult for the ordinary citizen to find the state. Um, invariably, they have to go through intermediaries, through brokers, through predons, through unelected officials, uh, and the transaction costs are incredibly high. And so the, the, the real problem here often is simply finding the state. There's also then the vertical, what I call the vertical problem of, of participatory democracy, which is, can you indeed ensure that the chain of sovereignty is preserved? That is, once uh, decisions have been democratically authorized, legislation has been passed, policies have been made, are the resources actually being distributed accordingly? Are the popular preferences as expressed through the democratic process being translated into policy outputs um, and this is the problem of delegation. And you know, we're, we're, we all remember Rajiv Gandhi saying, on you know, only only uh, five pesa on on the rupee ever actually gets to the beneficiary. And this is the classic leakage problem, right? So that that's more of a, a technical problem uh, per se, but um, uh, certainly an important one. All right, so that's that's the sort of general setup and. The argument that I'm going to make, and I'm going to illustrate it by comparing differential outcomes in India and Brazil, and if I have time, a little bit on South Africa, the general problem I'm going to argue is an imbalance between political society and civil society. And, you know, obviously Chatterjee has famously written about political society and civil society. I have a slightly different understanding of each term. And so I want to be clear what I mean by political society and what I mean by civil society. And you can see my, my definition on the slide. Uh, political society is constituted of actors that compete for, as well as the institutions that regulate the right to exercise legitimate political power. And this is a very, I think, conventional definition of um, political society. It is a sphere of instrumental strategic action. That is, political parties have one objective in mind. They are organizations that were developed and deployed in order to capture state power. That is what political parties do. And in the process, what political society does is simply, quote, aggregate interest. Um, that is, the electoral mechanism is really just a mechanism of adding up interests and identifying the majority or at least the, the plural, the, the plurality interest um, and, and making that interest the basis for state action. Um, and that's a necessary and non-negotiable element of any democracy. Um, but political society has its own problems um, and needs to be counterbalanced uh, in this argument by the role of, of an active mobilized civil society. So what is civil society? Civil society is constituted of movements and organizations that claim legitimacy on the grounds that they are pursuing a public interest, right? They're not interested in power per se, in achieving power. They're not interested in making money, um, entering and controlling the state apparatus or reproducing a primary identity for that matter. Now, whether or not that's, that claim is genuine and authentic and sincere is an empirical question, but civil society actors by definition act in the interest of the quote public. Um, and I think this is, this is key to underscore. And in the democratic ideal and civil society can be very undemocratic, um, but when it achieves or approximates the democratic ideal, civil society is voluntary, it's based on rights, and it's based on what Habermas would call communicative action. That is, it exercises largely discursive power, right? The power to convince people that this is the, quote, right thing to do. So I, I want to bring this down back to local government um, and, and, and begin this comparison of Brazil uh, and India. And as I said, if I have time, I'll, I'll throw South Africa in. Um, I think 
and again, I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but I think it, 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 it needs to be said and said over and over again, that one of the great challenges of deepening democracy in much of the global South, although this is often a problem in, in, in older democracies as well, is the problem of decentralization, of devolving genuine democratic authority and power to local levels of government. And here, the legacies of colonialism are really clear. Uh, Mahmoud Mamdani, the, the, schol the Af scholar of Africa, in, his, in a very famous book called Citizens and Subject, coined the term decentralized despotism, that the legacy of colonialism is first and foremost the legacy of having empowered at the local level despots, you know, be they landlords or caciques, or in the African case, chiefs, um, local government was never democratic. It was uh, highly despotic. Um, and local government has long been experienced in India as in Brazil as more administration and despotic power than as democratic governance. Um, the transactions with the state are very top down and are, are often mediated. And we really have uh, subjects at the local level and not so much citizens with extremely limited spaces for participation. And of course, this problem is well known. And what's interesting is not only in India with the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment, but when South Africa transitioned to uh, democracy in, in 86, uh, 94, I'm sorry, and when South uh, Brazil transitioned to a con new constitution in 1989, it, it's quite extraordinary that all three countries roughly at the same time introduced very explicit constitutional provisions and very robust constitutional provisions to promote participatory decentralization. Um, however, and I'll get to uh, the outcome in a moment. Um, today, I actually wanna focus on cities though. Much of the literature on decentralization in India, you know, understandably given um, the distribution of the rural urban population has been on, on panchayats and, and rural decentralization. But in, in, in comparative terms, what really distinguishes India, uh, differentiates India from Brazil and South Africa is how little power has been decentralized to cities. Uh, there have been you know, some progress in, in, uh, in terms of rural decentralization, empowering panchayats, but cities in, in India uh, remain quite underpowered when it comes to being able to actually govern themselves. And I think this going forward presents one of the real developmental challenges in India. So let me first say a few things about the challenges of urban governance, which I think are quite unique. It's a, it's a really st very strategic site of analysis because cities are unique. Cities are unique in the classic sense because they are what we call force multipliers, right? People come together, they aggregate. Uh, economists talk about agglomeration effects. Uh, sociologists and others talk about the capacities for innovation and denser and more vibrant associational life. And in all, all those respects, uh, cities are for, force multipliers. At the same time, and by the very same logic, uh, cities are a scarce resource. Um, the incumbents of cities, and this is an argument that goes back to Max Weber's work on the European medieval city, the incumbents of cities want to control access to the city. They want to um, monopolize the high returns associated um, of, uh, with living in the city by, in effect, rationing space. And, and you know, the extreme example, of, co of course, of this is the apartheid city. Under apartheid, um, for blacks or, or non-whites, including uh, Indians, to enter the city, they had to have permission, right? And the city was a rationed space. There's other mechanisms at work um, in democracies that, that do the same thing. So the city on the one hand is a force multiplier, on the other hand, it's a rationed space. In the contemporary city, one of the great challenges is the degree to which the financialization of the global economy has accelerated the process of land commodification. Right? If there's one development of the last 30 years that has had a profound transformative impact on India, and that really has been driven by globalization, it's increasing price of land. So land is uh, this um, in increasingly scarce commodity that commands extremely high returns in, in competitive and increasingly global markets. And as a result, many would argue 
uh, that the growth machine has become the default in cities of the global south. And I should, for those of you who aren't familiar with the growth machine literature, this is urban sociologists in the United States who've argued that cities are growth machines in the sense that they're largely constituted of an alliance of the local state, the municipal government, with developers, the goal being to maximize the returns to land, right? So that the key function of, of municipal governance is increasing the returns to land. Um, and we've actually heard this in some policy circles in India, where the argument has been, we need to reform cities in order to really accentuate uh, the returns to land. Um, and of course, the growth machine is exclusionary. Right? It's, it's focused on, on commodification and increasing uh, returns to land rather than being focused on affordability, inclusion, sustainability, et cetera. Um, and in the context of the global south, especially as agriculture, as land scarcity increases and agricultural productivity increases and it's increasingly hard to sustain rural populations, we see increasing uh, 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 urbanization, surplus populations that can't be absorbed, which in turn produces informalization, both of the, of the economy or at least livelihoods, as well as living conditions, as in the expansion of slums and informal settlements. So this poses a really, I think this is the great developmental challenge of the 21st century in the great megacities of the world. And I should point out that every estimate suggests that all future population growth and all of the future growth in, in poverty is going to happen in cities. Um, and so cities are confronted with this fundamental contradiction of, of being able to manage growth um, while at the same time um, being inclusive and being able to accommodate these surplus populations. And that poses the classic developmental question, can growth and inclusion be coordinated? So I just wanna give you a very, very quick overview of, of some basic empirics here, comparing major Indian cities, uh, major Brazilian and major South African cities, you know, two essential services. It's, it's really difficult to enjoy the possibilities and the economic returns of the city if you don't have basic capabilities. As Sen would argue, it's really difficult to achieve basic capabilities if you don't have water, if you don't have sanitation. So. I always think of piped water and, and toilets as really important indicators of access to the city. And as you could see, the census numbers for India are, are, are um, lacking um, in terms of universal coverage. Uh, Brazil has more or less achieved universal coverage. South Africa is more or less where Brazil is. And here it's important to include South Africa because South Africa has the same per roughly the same per capita income as Brazil does, right? So. It, it, it just underscores the fact that economic prosperity and the level of economic development in and of itself does not guarantee uh, equitable service delivery. Um, on, a, on a policy front, uh, the policy for slums and the policy for low income housing. And again, and here I'm talking roughly about the last 30 years and the, the, you know, these are sort of broad generalizations, but um, in other work, I've, I've supported this with, with um, in, empirical materials. Um, but poli slum policy in India, I think, has largely been ineffective. There's not been much redevelopment of slums. Um, there have been a lot of uh, implementation issues when it comes to pursuing uh, slum redevelopment. And a lot of that has to do with land issues and problems of coordination across different agencies. Um, low income housing um, initiatives in India have largely ended up subsidizing middle class housing rather than the, the truly low income groups. South Africa has made very little progress on slums, but a lot more on low income housing, although not always well integrated with other forms of service delivery. So it's a bit, bit of a middling case, if you will. Brazil, on the other hand, has had quite a bit of success. Um, there's been regularization of informal settlements. Uh, most of uh, favela dwellers, uh, slums are called favelas in Brazil. Most of them have rights to their homes and, and the land that they've occupied. Um, and there have been a range of interventions that have uh, in effect formalized the favelas and that service delivery has improved dramatically. And there have been some quite large uh, federal uh, programs implemented by municipalities that have provided new low income housing. And the success there has been a mixed, but it, it, there has been uh, some impact. 
Um, so why these different policy outcomes? And this is the argument that I'm gonna make. I'm not gonna spend much time on this table right now uh, because I'll come back to it at the very end of the talk, but this is uh, essentially um, the, 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 uh, the analytic categories that I'm gonna draw on and the outcomes that I wanna emphasize. So um, I wanna talk about the capacity of the local municipal state I wanna talk about its autonomy. Can it actually govern itself rather than just be an agent implementing uh, central government or provincial state uh, policies? And thirdly, is that local municipal government, the government of Bangalore um, or, or Johannesburg or of Sao Paulo embedded in civil society? Does it actually answer to local civil society? And the three outcomes that I wanna emphasize, I wanna argue that in dominated by what myself and Parto Mukupadai in an article, article have called the, the growth cabal. Um, it's similar to the growth machine, except it's not as organized. It's more of a cabal. It's uh, what's called the land mafia, the land grab raj, et cetera. And that's really the dominant logic of cities uh, in India. In South Africa, there's a proper growth machine, namely that the landed interests and the developers work closely with government to develop land and, and develop malls and infrastructure, et cetera. And it's quite planned and organized, um, but it's very developer driven and not as inclusive as, as one would hope for. And then in Brazil, a combination of high capacity governance, autonomy and embeddedness in civil society has allowed for the formation of what I call social cities. That is cities that really do, or at least have become much more inclusive. And that's the argument that I'll be developing in the next few slides while being very mindful of uh, the time that I have. So the growth cabal in India, lots of growth in, in uh, the last two, three decades, as we all know, that growth in India has been very much concentrated in cities and not just any cities, especially the mega cities, Bangalore, of course, being at the top of the list. A lot of that growth in Bangalore is a bit the exception here. Uh, with the booming IT sector, but a lot of that growth has been in what Gandhi and Walton call rent thick sectors. So rather than uh, investing in new productive capabilities, um, a lot of the investment has been in, in rents, in, in assets that, that produced rents such as land, obviously, and that's been a huge growth sector, although it has been leveling out recently. But also a lot of what the, the global cities literature calls brokerage functions. So, uh, you know, the, the, the role that many Indian mega cities play is not so much production and investing in innovation as brokering the role of the Indian economy with the global economy. So this is, you know, finance, insurance, politics, various brokerage functions. Um, infrastructure has not kept up. Uh, JNNURM was a very concerted effort to ramp up infrastructure spending in Indian cities. It, it's, it's still at a quite low level compared to China. Um, and th these are sort of old numbers, um, um, but I, th I think this is still largely the case. And even to the degree, degree that there have been investments in urban infrastructure, they've been highly skewed uh, towards largely middle-class interests. Um, Parto Mukhopadhyay did an analysis of Jane and URM spending in New Delhi and found uh, that there, the, 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 most of the money went to flyovers, um, you know, which benefit sort of middle-class households with automobiles um, and very, very little money actually went into expanding the water infrastructure of the city. Um, there's also been increasing land rationing and this is something um, we, we documented in this project called Cities of Delhi um, that um, um, it's often local state actors, the DDA in Delhi, for example, that control a lot of land and that ration the land and rather than using it for inclusive development are using it to uh, benefit land development with, with high returns. And so we, we do see some evidence that the size of slums and unauthorized colonies is actually growing. And with that growth, of course, increasing spatial inequality. And here, I just wanna give you a very sort of illustrative overview of the degree to which uh, Indian cities are uh, incredibly segregated in terms of access to basic resources. Um, elsewhere, I've called this differentiated citizenship. And 
what you have here simply is a list of the different legally recognized settlement types in Delhi, going from JJCs all the way to planned colonies. Uh, th this is state of Delhi data, by the way. Uh, it's old and needs to be updated, but it gives you a, a snapshot of the, of the problem. Uh, you have the population, you have the percentages, you have the degree of le legality or illegality. And then just to illustrate the service delivery problem, um, we characterized uh, the, the, the nature of water supply in these different settlement types, right? And this for me is just a very graphic way of illustrating the degree to which a basic right of citizenship, the right to water, uh, it's, it, it's difficult to be part of a city and part of its uh, promise and, and economic opportunity if you don't have access to water. And access to water is highly rationed across settlement types. So where does this problem emerge from or how do we characterize this problem? And I wanna argue that this is a chain of sovereignty problem that a local government, including cities, is, is, is closer to a form of what Latin Americanists used to call bureaucratic authoritarianism than it is to uh, 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 democratic participation. The, the surface area of the municipal state is extremely limited. It's much better in cities like Mumbai, arguably, the Gujarati cities. I've been doing uh, survey work with Janagraha and my colleague Ashutosh Varshni, and we're finding that Gujarati cities and uh, generally do somewhat better in terms of governance, in terms of access to governance, that Kochi uh, in Kerala is, is maybe you know, the, 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 the most democratic uh, city uh, in India, which is not entirely surprising. But for the most part, it's difficult to access the city. Um, and as a result, citizens engage it more as clients than they do as bearers of rights. And of course, there were efforts with the constitutional amendments to um, um, empower cities and to make them more participatory. Um, those efforts have not been that successful. There's been a lot of resistance from politicians and officials who have a vested stake in a more centralized setup. There are some exceptions like Kerala, you know, but by and large, local democracy, I think is best characterized as a form of fragmented brokerage. That is almost all the transactions, not all, but most transactions between citizens and the local state, the municipal authorities are mediated either by political parties or brokers. Uh, this incentivizes um, narrow rent seeking over the provision of public goods the classic example for me is slums that get a tanker truck instead of slums that get piped water. Um, and this really does sort of fit uh, Lamp Pritchett's famous image of the flailing state. Um, so I wanna argue that Indian cities, and again, I shouldn't be generalizing, there's plenty of variation within India, of course, but by and large, and especially as compared to Brazil, Indian cities have still have quite limited state capacity. Uh, most agencies, uh, the land development, uh, water, sanitation are either controlled by the state or by the central government. They have, of course, very limited uh, own, own resources, fiscal resources. As a result, there are massive coordination problems. The, the different agencies do not work well together. Um, they tend to be more preoccupied with protecting their territory, their turf, as well as the land they control than actually promoting inclusive development. There are a lot of perverse incentives, um, rent seeking, um, and there's very little actual broad-based civic participation. So much so that Arjuna Padurai, writing about Mumbai, coined, I think, a very felicitous phrase, namely this idea of citizens without a city. That is, Indian citizens, of course, have rights, civic and political, at the central level, at the state level, but when it comes to cities, they really don't have much of a city and as a result really can't exercise their rights of citizenship, at least not in terms of demanding and claiming basic social services. As, as the chart that I showed you um, highlights, there's a lot of differentiated legality, different settlements literally have different rights. Um, there's very weak representation. Chennai has never really had city councillors and, and the city depends almost entirely on the bureaucracy. And even where there are city councillors, as in Delhi, maybe things have changed with that, but oftentimes city councillors simply don't have a lot of power. And again, there are some ex exceptions such as Kochi, to some degree Mumbai. 
Um, civil society, to the extent that it is mobilized, tends to be mobilized by the dominant uh, middle class groups. Uh, I'm thinking of RWAs in Delhi, for example. And for the most part, identities um, uh, prevail over the exercise of citizenship. And here, I just want to argue, and at, at, at some level, I think this is simple, but I, I think it's, it's, it's at the heart of the problem. There's a misalignment of institutional power and, and political authorization. The, the institutional power resides in the agencies of the municipal state, but they're authorized politically at a, at a different level. Right? They're authorized by the state or by the central government. They're not authorized from below at the level of the city itself. And this creates a fundamental misalignment of institutional power and political authorization. So I see that I'm, I'm, I'm running short of time. So I'm gonna skip the South Africa case, but just to put this into a comparative frame, let me quickly uh, uh, highlight some of what's transpired in Brazil in the, in the last three decades. And 1991, the, the new constitution in Brazil was passed in 1989, which devolved a lot of power to cities. And this is the HDI, you're all familiar with the Human Development Index, a, a somewhat crude but useful measure of basic capabilities. And as you can see, um, Brazil in 1991 looks a lot like India. Um, the numbers are quite similar. Um, most most of the country is is below five on this index, which which um, um, goes from uh, 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 zero zero to one, so it's 0.5. Um, and what you see in the south, in particular, are the big cities: Sao Paulo, um, uh, Florianópolis, Rio. The south is generally more prosperous. It's it's the industrial part of Brazil, and you see somewhat higher HDI numbers in the south. And these points, by the way, are all cities; they're all municipalities. And then by 2000, you start to see a quite dramatic improvement in the HDI, uh, especially in the South, again, which is already quite well off and industrialized. Um, but by 2010, and this is, the, this is 10 years into um, Lula's uh, presidency and, and the two terms that the PT, three terms actually, that the PT, the Workers' Party was in power, uh, by 2010, you see a dramatic improvement, um, including in the North, which you know historically is where you know, slavery was most entrenched and most of the racialized inequality is concentrated. So very dramatic improvements. And it's very clear from the data that a lot of these improvements are um, a return on investments in basic services at the urban municipal level. So what's happened in Brazil that explains um, the fact that cities have become increasingly social, social in the sense that citizens, including the urban poor, have access to uh, basic services. Um, so there's been a lot of growth uh, driven by the commodity boom of the last 20 years, for sure. But one has to translate that growth into actually actual capabilities. And that growth has been accompanied with in increasing inclusion. Uh, there have been a lot of legal interventions. Land regularization was absolutely critical at the beginning of this phase. So the favelas, the dwellers of favelas got basic land rights. Expansion of social programs, major investments in primary education, basic public health care, expansion of sanitation and water services. Um, and so you see the, the basic infrastructure reach into informal settlements and slums. I argue that this itself is a result of the degree to which the local state in Brazil has become embedded. Uh, the local state is much more powerful, has more constitutional authority than the Indian state, has more resources, um, but it's also embedded in civil society. And most famously, this was done through um, the diffusion of participatory budgeting, you know, the idea that a part of the budget is subject to a process of civil society driven participation. But many other mechanisms, power sharing mechanisms, something called council democracy, every sector, health, sanitation, education has a constitutionally mandated uh, council, which includes representation from civil society and they control actual budget. So these are meaningful forms of participation. And then there's also federal law, a federal law called the city statute, which mandates participation in all planning processes. So as a result, I argue that the surface area of the, the municipal state in Brazil 
uh, has expanded significantly. There are many more points of access for citizens, for civil society activists, and this in turn has led to a lot of uh, forms of co-production. So just to give you one example, uh, Sao Paulo has a very famous housing movement that's been extremely effective in delivering um, low, low income housing. And that housing has been delivered through a partnership of state, municipal state agencies and social movements working together to you know, identify uh, housing projects and to make those projects as inclusive as possible. And of course, limitations to all of this, but it's, 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 uh, it's had a visible impact on the spatial form of the city. And all of this uh, really emerges out of the social movements of the 1980s uh, in Brazil. Um, this was towards the end of the authoritarian regime, um, a broad coalition of civil society organizations, unions, uh, women's groups, LBGTQ groups, but also many urban groups um, specifically concerned with issues of housing and service delivery came together and mobilized um, and, and in some cases uh, captured uh, power at the municipal level. By 88, there's a new constitution and that constitution itself was in part the product of these urban social movements and uh, included a lot of provisions for devolution of, of resources and authority to municipalities or municipos as they're known in Brazil, as well as various mechanisms for participation. This produced a form of what I call regulated autonomy. The cities have a lot of autonomy and they have the legal uh, resources and wherewithal to defend that autonomy, but they're also regulated. Um, so something like Bolsa Familia, which is Brazil's famous conditional uh, uh, cash transfer program is administered by the center, right? So the, the basic criteria of who gets how much money and the conditionalities are set by the center but the program is actually implemented with a great degree of discretion um, at, at the municipal level, right? Um, but discretion that is regulated to avoid um, um, problems such as clientelism, which is a, 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 a traditional problem in India, in Brazilian cities. And by and large, I want to suggest that um, this um, success in, in promoting the social city and a right to the city um, emerges out of the fact that political and civil society in Brazil are much more balanced than is the case in India, uh, that movements can engage the state without being co-opted, they can preserve their autonomy. We see this with the, the, the Sanatarista movement, which is the movement of healthcare providers, um, that by and large citizenship has been strengthened, that your average urban citizen in Brazil can engage the state as a bearer of rights, and this has sort of broken the traditional hold of clientelism and strengthened the possibilities for programmatic governance. And this uh, brings me back, back to the slide that I showed you earlier. Um, again, comparing India and Brazil, uh, clear differences in capacity in terms of um, you know, the size of municipal agencies and resources that they command, uh, very <clears throat> clear differences in political autonomy in Brazilian cities have a lot more discretion in deciding how to allocate resources, developing their own policies and programs. Uh, Brazilian cities, moreover, and this is not true of all Brazilian cities, of course, it depends oftentimes on the, the nature of local civil society, but it's, it's very difficult to think of any program, any policy in urban Brazil in which state agencies don't actively work with and co-produce with civil society organizations. And all of this being facilitated by the various participatory structures that have been constitutionally mandated. Um, and so as, a, as, a, as an outcome uh, in India, we see the, the, the dominance of the growth cabal and, and the logic of the growth machine. Whereas in Brazil, there are signs that cities have become more social in the sense of being more inclusive. Um, so I, I, Chandan, I'm, I'm done. I have two more slides, if, if I may. Um, yes, yes, thanks. Just to wrap up. So in the Indian case, I do want to argue, and you know, this is, I'm not going to comment on the, the current regime, you know, post 2014, um, where I think many of these problems have become worse, but I think even prior to 2014, there was a problem of what I call democratic involution in the Indian context. 
Uh, political society in India has always prevailed over civil society. Uh, Sudipta Kaviraj argued a long time ago that democracy was introduced in India with very few preconditions. It was driven by political elites. Um, and even though there was mass mobilization, civil society at the time of transition was not well formed. And to the extent it was, it represented middle class rather than lower class interests. The, the nation building project has been consolidated largely through local accommodations, usually accommodate, accommodating local power brokers, which has reinforced these tendencies of uh, demo, uh, decentralized despotism that uh, Mamdani talks about. Um, and as many have argued, including Amit Ahuja's wonderful book on Dalit mobilization and, and party politics, uh, in the North in particular, much less so in the South, political parties came before movements. And politics has been dominated by political society at the expense, I would argue, of, of um, civil society mobilization. And this has led to a certain instrumentalization of politics. Politics is really about power. It's really about capturing resources and distributing scarce rents. You know, the middle class has been particularly, especially the new aspiring neo uh, middle class has been especially good in the context of urban India and in hoarding opportunities, educational opportunities, public investment opportunities, and that in the absence of any kind of encompassing formations and broad based civil society organizations, identity mm -hmm. politics and patronage tend to prevail over more programmatic in interventions. You know, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, there have has been an increasing diffusion of rights-based discourses. I think during the, you know, the the UPA government with the formation of the National Advisory Council and Rega RTI, these were all very civil society-driven initiatives. You know, that have had a significant impact. Some of which is now being eroded. Uh, so there have been opportunities for civil society actors to reshape the political agenda. And of course, at the subnational level, you know, I've written, of course, a lot about Kerala. Others have argued that there's a Dravidian model in Tamil Nadu. Um, and clearly, in terms of promoting social development, Tamil Nadu and Kerala have outperformed uh, northern states. And I think that that illustrates the importance of um, this equation or this balance between civil and political society. And so these are just a, a few concluding points. And since we're short on time, um, you know, I really just want to, uh, th this just reiterates uh, the points that I've been making throughout the talk. And maybe I'll just leave this slide uh, here um, and I'll end with that. And again, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to, you know, put these arguments forward. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to really make sense of these three really complex cases uh, and in particular, to how to forefront the, the challenges of decentralization and democratic participation. So thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Patrick. Sorry. No, he wants it to be there. Um, now the floor is open for questions. Some, of, some are typing them in. Um, can we see the chat box? This isn't, uh... um, Vandana, my former colleague from APU, has a question. Uh, thinking aloud here, since you mentioned the embeddedness of institutions and the role of that in shaping the nature of democracy and its outcomes, where do you think, where do you see the work of Karl Polanyi in helping us read the Indian situation and the nature of Indian democracy? So uh, Chandan, should I take a series of questions or uh, answer? I, I see only two as of now. Um, I can read out the first one, which, um, where is the state? The state sits in the office, it's practically not in action mode. And he feels that the low achievements are probably due to the state not being in the field. Even field officers sit in offices. Um, on the other hand, as you rightly said, many civil societies are interested and capable of carrying out the state projects effectively. How do you think the state can institutionalize 
such participation by civil society. Mm -hmm. So yeah, can I go and ahead and respond? I, shall we have the third question and then you can take them all together. Um, no, no, this is not a question, but please go on. So uh, thank you for asking the Polanyi question. I, as it is, I think I, I threw in too many, you know, Tilly and Habermas, and, and I, I didn't want to overpopulate the argument with references to uh, classic theories. But yes, this is very much a, a Polanyian argument uh, about, but on, on, on two mm. levels. And I should clarify that I'm using embeddedness in a Polanyian sense, but with an important qualification. Um, so, you know, Polanyi was, was very clear that the market economy um, left to its own devices as a self-regulating entity uh, would have devastating effects on, on society. And, and, and that's what Polanyi is famous for. Um, and argued that liberalism, or what we would now call neoliberalism, is an argument for disembedding the market, for allowing the market to govern itself and to commodify everything in sight, land, labor, capital, um, and that this would have uh, catastrophic or, as he said, devastating effects on society. And so that the key is to re-embed the market, that during the 19th century, the market became disembedded, um, no longer uh, secured, embedded in uh, institutions of social regulation, and we needed to re-embed it. And in effect, the growth or the rise and the growth of the European welfare state is an effort to re-embed the market in society, to hold uh, market actors and market forces accountable to uh, society. Um, the qualification here is that I'm making that argument for democracy itself. Um, that all too often in the political science literature in particular, and I think this is probably more of an issue in the United States than in the Indian literature, but uh, the, you know, the literature uh, on democracy is dominated by political scientists. And you know, they tend to emphasize institutional design, you know, good constitutions, good bureaucrats, and good political parties. And, proper elections, et cetera. What's missing in all of that is the degree to which those elements of political society, the institutions, the, the bureaucratic and legal forms of authorization and the political parties themselves are actually embedded in um, uh, civil society. So I'm, I'm using embeddedness very much in the sense that Polanyi did, but going on beyond, going beyond just thinking about the market being embedded to thinking about how the state itself and democratic processes can be embedded in civil society, which segues uh, directly into the second question, which if I understood, I mean, I think, you know, in uh, Yamini Iyer at CPR and many others, you know, have, uh, and this is something we don't do enough in our research, in including my own research, because it requires a lot of field work, which is extremely challenging and time consuming. But we don't study the frontline state enough, right? I mean, the, the weakest link in the state is always the front line. It's the teacher who teaches, the nurse who administers, it's the you know local agricultural officer who works with farmers to increase productivity or to promote sustainability. And what we do know of the Indian state is that frontline workers have almost zero autonomy and hence zero capacity for problem solving at the local level. Right, and this is a, a pervasive problem across the Indian bureaucracy. I, I think this is one of the key challenges of rethinking the state and making the state not only more effective, uh, but more accountable. And and I just want to give you an example from Brazil, and there there are many others, but I, I just this one strikes me as especially um, um, dramatic and and uh, informative. In, in in Brazil, there's an institution called the Ministerio Público. Um, the, the public ministry. And it's essentially um, the, the legal apparatus of the Brazilian state. And it's populated by lawyers. Um, and these lawyers, um, they're public advocates. They have the power to bring collective um, um, class action lawsuits against the government. And what the Ministerio Público does, um, it's frontline actors who are lawyers. Um, what they do is they work closely with social movements, 
say the housing movement, to ensure that the law is actually being implemented and to hold the state accountable. So they co-produce with so environmental groups, for example, uh, file you know, hundreds, if not thousands of class action lawsuits every year against the Brazilian government. And it's essentially public lawyers, uh, government lawyers working with uh, civil society organizations and activists to hold the state accountable uh, for its own laws and legislation, right? And this is a classic example of co-production. So you have a, an alliance of a frontline state worker, in this case, a lawyer and a public advocate with a civil society organization, right? Um, and I think this is a pervasive problem, uh, you know, across the, the, the Indian bureaucracy. Um, and normally we, again, we think, of the, we think of Akhil Gupta's book on his BDO officer, you know, but I think this is an especially challenging problem in the urban sector as well. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, those of you who prefer to ask questions directly, please raise your hand. Um, we do have the option of asking them yourself. Did he raise his hand? Yeah. Dr. Ravindra has a question. Uh, you can start yes. while we wait for others. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Patrick. It was a very, very interesting discourse. And uh, especially the difference that you brought out between India and Brazil. Uh, where, in fact, you present Brazil as a success story as against India, which is still struggling. Maybe the conflict over between political and civil society. I don't know whether that is the key question because uh, going from your uh, example of Brazil, where you say civil society is more autonomous and uh, better administered, I don't know, in the sense that local government is better administered and all that. Uh, what I would like to know is, I mean, the how has this happened over the years? I mean, both the colonies and all the colonial societies. But in uh, given the history of colonialism, in India, it is true, we still follow many of the British laws, the municipal laws and so on, you know, and town planning laws particularly. In fact, uh, you have not mentioned anything about uh, city planning. I mean, in India where, for instance, the city or master plans uh, just go worry. Plan is one thing and implementation is another. Although so many civil society organizations keep taking up these uh, issues. And now in cities like Bangalore, civil society has emerged somewhat, if not strong, but at least they have a voice and they're able to, you know, converse with the government, government organizations. And uh, I myself had initiated such uh, conversation because I was a civil servant myself, I mean, having worked in the local government as well as state government and all that. Uh, but what essentially accounts for this difference between Indian cities and uh, Brazilian cities? I'm not able to still grasp. No, th that, that's an incredibly important question. So you know, first, I, you know, I should be clear, I mean, I'm, I'm one should never generalize about India. Um, you know, there's there's uh, such extraordinary variation across North exactly. and South, across states, across cities, and it goes without saying that the status and the power of civil society you know, varies dramatically across Indian cities. And having done quite a bit of work in Bangalore myself, and being somewhat familiar uh, with Bangalore, I I you know I'm always amazed at how innovative um, and vibrant some civil society organizations are. So um, I, I still think compared to what I see in Brazil, it, it pales in comparison, unfortunately. Um, you know, that there are sectors and certain interventions where civil society organizations have, you know, some say or some capacity to engage with officials and agencies. But there's also, um, you know, vast areas of urban governance that are still extremely top down. And if there's any sort of, you know, democratic intervention, it's on the part of representatives, but oftentimes they're more interested in, you know, um, supporting their own patronage networks and advancing programmatic interests. So I, it's, it's a difference of degree. Um, um, so that's, that's sort of the empirical part of the comparison. 
you're you're totally absolutely right of course to ask about the history of this and i think that's a book unto itself um and you know an obvious difference is you know brazil became independent of its colonial overlord a, a long time ago and and has had much longer to develop or to overcome uh, the legacies of colonial rule and you know brazilian elites were governing sao paulo back in the beginning of the you know the early 1800s and have been you know developing institutions of urban governance ever since um, um, so, you know, the histories are different, there, there's no doubt. That said, you know, up until the return to democracy in 84 and the new constitution in 89, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, democracy in Brazil was much more elite dominated than Indian democracy. I mean, the vast majority of Brazilians basically did not have the right to vote until the, um, until the return to democracy in the 80s, right? So. So on the one hand, you know, um, in, in terms of changing uh, the law and, and developing new institutions, Brazil has had a more post-colonial time to do that. You know, on the other hand, in terms of elite domination, uh, um, the legacies of colonialism in Brazil, especially when you take into account race. I mean, I, you know, Brazil is a predominantly black country uh, which is still governed almost exclusively by by European descendants, right? Um, and and so in in terms of the class equation, if you will, you know, Brazil in some ways, at least until the '80s, was less democratic than India was, right? Um, but you know, having said that, that's just a very um, uh, you know superficial answer to your question because uh, it would take a much deeper a dive into into you know the the full uh, complexity of of colonial histories to really be able to provide a compelling answer to your question. May I ask one more question, if you don't mind? Yes, but please keep it brief. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just I would like to know again the difference in terms of see coordination, which you mentioned, is a very important issue, which is certainly true, and we are all struggling with coordination uh, at uh, different levels in particularly at the city level between various agencies uh, how is the how is coordination achieved in brazil say compared to indian cities so uh, uh, that's another fantastic question and and since you've experienced this more directly than i have it's 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 uh, I'm, I'm 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 curious what you'll you'll how you'll react to my answer so Part of it is a simple mechanism, namely Brazilian mayors are quite powerful. Uh, a Brazilian mayor has is a bit like a chief minister in India. Um, so they have a lot of executive power. So from above, of course, they can coordinate. Um, a second answer is that the planning departments or planning authorities uh, in Brazilian cities have been really empowered by the city statute, this law that I mentioned uh, that was passed at the federal level. So, you know, I mean, at least the cities that I know in India, you know, the planners, they, they do, as you said, town planning, they, they put plans together. They don't actually have the authority to enforce coordination across line departments. Um, whereas in Brazil, they, they have much more power. Um, and it's a profession that's uh, highly valued. Uh, they, they all come from University of Sao Paulo's planning school, you know, and they're famous and well known. Um, and so in terms of professional status and, and authority, they just have a lot more power. So there's more executive and planning capacity to begin with. But um, there's something else. And th this is work that one of my graduate students has done, and it's coming out as a book at Princeton University. He's actually shown that it's because of the social movements, the housing social movements in Sao Paulo, that the municipal agencies actually started working together. That is, the movements put so much pressure on these agencies, sort of constantly lobbying and protesting and making demands and infiltrating these agencies, right? So we know that in the health sector in Brazil, as well as, as well as the housing sector, many of the officials in those sectors come from these social movements um, and they rotate across agencies, right? So they have a much more sort of holistic, integrated understanding of urban governance, which in turn allows for a lot more 
coordination across agencies. And in India, the assumption is that IS officers are going to do this, right? Um, and, and there is some of that. I mean, I was recently in Bhubaneswar where they've initiated um, a really ambitious uh, project to provide 24 seven water to all slums and, and legalize uh, um, slum dwellers um, and give them formal rights to their land. And they made quite a, big, uh, quite a bit of progress. And it's quite clear that part of their success has to do with a, a very uh, proactive principal secretary you know, who's been able to coordinate across agencies, working with other IS officers, you know, with the, the political support of a chief minister who's clearly very committed to this project, et cetera. So, so it can happen in the Indian context as well, right? But it's, it's more common in Brazil, A, because of the executive power of the mayor's office, the, the prominence of planners, but also this almost continuous pressure from civil society organizations. Thank you for that answer. Right. Uh, Patrick, uh, there's a question here that wants you to reflect on initiatives in Delhi, like I think it's post Amadmi Party, the initiative, the Mohalla Committee initiatives, and yes. the Bagi Dari, he man says, that engages yeah. citizens in governance, etc. What do you think about these? Yeah, and look, I, I haven't done re my, own, my own research on this, so I, I can't speak with any real knowledge or authority. And what I know of what Ops been able to do in Delhi comes from you know what my friends at CPR and, uh, have told me, and and what I read in the media. And so this is it's quite fragmentary. But you, the, you know the the the. The two things to, you know, and I know there's a lot of debate about op and the, what it started out as a certain kind of party and maybe now it's a different kind of party, et cetera. But the, the two things about op which are interesting is that first, it's the first urban political party in India, aside from the Shiv Sena, right? Every other political party in India originates in, you know, more in the rural vote base and rural constituencies and is, is largely interested in, in, um, building up its support base in rural areas and often, you know, using urban resources to do that. Op is the first political party, you know, because it grew up in Delhi and Delhi is an urban state for all intents and purposes. Uh, Op is India's first urban political party, again, aside from the Shiv Sena. And so it's been very focused on urban development. And second, um, it's the, to my knowledge, and someone will correct me, no doubt, but I, I can't think of any party that self-consciously and programmatically emphasized decentralization and participation as much as opted, right? So from its you know, very genesis, it was all about promoting decentralization, participation, um, yeah, introducing um, primary healthcare units and uh, every so. And I was in Delhi when Op was first in power um, and had, had been there for two years. And, it was, it was palpable. I mean, on the ground, you know, you saw a lot of party workers um, holding meetings, uh, oh, yeah. you know, organizing uh, these local community health centers, et cetera. Uh, you know, beyond that, I, I, I just don't know enough to be able to comment. But in terms of the model and in terms of what ops programmatically has committed itself to doing, this is precisely the kind of, you know, oh, participatory democratic agenda that we see having evolved in Brazil. Patrick, there's a question here. Um, you want to, uh, <clears throat> a, a rabid communal slash corporatized state has been determining the nature of civil society in India during the last decade, empowering right-wing forces, almost totally decimating genuinely democratic civil society groups, which are resisting this nexus. Do you see stronger alternatives emerging in India that could reverse this trend? Yeah, I, so I, I agree entirely um, with that, that overview. Um, you know, I, I think the, the t uh, setting aside the uh, Hindutva agenda and the, and the demonization of a minority population, um, I think the, the two most alarming trends associated um, with the current government. And by the way, I've made exactly the same argument about Bolsonaro in Brazil, right? So, so Bolsonaro came to power in 2018, came to power, you know, uh, opposing the Workers' Party, et cetera. 
and I've actually written a comparative piece. And um, Bols what Bolsonaro and the BJP have in common is A, they're centralizing, right? They, they really tried to centralize fiscal resources and authority. Um, and they have been exerting increasing control over civil society and making it harder and harder for civil society groups to be autonomous and to engage the state. Um, and you know, both tendencies, of course, are, um, are a characteristic of uh, autocratic regimes, right? So we, we see a, a real backsliding in terms of democratic practices um, and this balance of power that I keep emphasizing. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't, again, this is not what I've been doing research on and, and what I have to say is, again, you know, more having to do with just sort of following developments and conversations with friends and colleagues. Um, I, 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 you know, I think the situation right now has reached a bit of a tipping point where it's become so perilous for civil society organizations to, you know, openly challenge state power. Um, you know, that we're seeing a, a sort of rapid erosion of, of civil society autonomy. And one fear is that th this has indeed, you know, we're past the tipping point. Um, you know, that said, there's, I, I, there's two things. So one, you know, the running joke in the United States when Trump was in power was that the biggest opposition party isn't Democratic Party, it's California. Uh, in other words, that the most important bulwark against these autocratic and centralizing tendencies is federalism, right? And we're seeing that in India, of course. I mean, you know, the, B the BJP has, has, has secured its power in many states, but has little traction in, 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 in Kerala and Tamil Nadu and lost the elections in West Bengal. So, you know, federalism is still an, an important um, a source for uh, preserving um, alternative politics and and nurturing, you know, alternative uh, visions of of what a vibrant democracy looks like. The 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 other um, in, inherited resource that um, that that will I hopefully will sustain democracy going forward is the rights discourse. I mean, I I do think, you know, that in the last uh, two or three decades. You know the right to work, the right to health, the right to food. Um, we see this a lot in in our uh, survey work in Indian cities. You know when we ask slum dwellers and the urban poor, you know uh, what they think they should get from government, et cetera. They 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 use the language of rights. You know increasingly, um, you know they see themselves as having a right to uh, so, 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 uh, socioeconomic development, et cetera. And um, and you know, I think the government is playing on that and, see, and sees itself as delivering welfare, but it's a very patrimonialized form of welfare. And I, I have doubts about, you know, over the long term, how effective this highly patrimonialized form of welfare, where you know everything is delivered as if it were a gift from you know the 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 the, the, the leader. Um, I, I have some doubts about how successful that can be over the long term. And I'm, I'm also struck by the extent to which at the state level, be it Odisha or Kerala or Maharashtra, you know, there, there, there's a different set of politics and emphasis on welfare, um, you know, that, that has its own, hopefully, somewhat autonomous logic. Thanks, Patrick. Your question. I think I have two quick questions. Um, one was this, this moment, this 1991 moment in Brazil, when the massive devolution of power to cities happened. Uh, can you give us a sense of what was behind this? Was it a yes. top-down thing or was it a result of demand from below? And secondly, I was wondering where informality figures in this model, uh, Patrick, because the way you've structured it, you're nudging everyone to think of increased formalization of processes uh, away from the informality that uh, you know that allows clientelism to thrive etc um, but we do notice another side to informality that you know that is democratic for want of a better word that allows access to people in fairly inexpensive ways a foothold in the state arrangement if you will um, so the tensions between this demand of yours and, yeah, no, that, yeah. And the no, was informality. Yeah, br brilliant question. So, 
on the constitution question in Brazil, the 88 constitution, I, you know, again, these are the particularities of Brazilian history. It was an authoritarian military regime until 84. It then opened up. There were elections. It was kind of messy. The first president was hopelessly corrupt and he was pushed out by a social movement. And much like what is happening as we speak in Chile, um, there was so much discontent with political society uh, that the demand for a new constitution, you know, reached a sort of tipping point. Um, and the political elites agreed to have a constitutional convention and 100,000 representatives from civil society showed up in Brasilia and were part of the negotiating process. This was also the high point of the Workers' Party mobilization. So the making of the constitution itself was quite participatory, right? And so you get, I, the, I think the Brazilian constitution is now the longest constitution in the world and it has the most social rights provision, including provisions for participation. So this was very much a, a bottom-up constitution making process, um, quite unique, but as we now see being replicated in Chile. And your question about formality and formality is absolutely key. And of course, you're absolutely right. You know, in the absence of enforceable, routinized rights, uh, people have to resort to informality, brokers w working outside the law, et cetera. And, you know, a lot of this is, quote, democratic in the sense of, of people seizing their rights or, or, or doing whatever it is they have to do to build a house, uh, to get a permit, to get a kid into school, to have access to resources that they're not getting as a matter of rights. So, you know, in that sense, we have to recognize that informality is, as you say, can be very democratic, empowering, et cetera. But what I would say is that it's a low level equilibrium. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in the absence of formal rights, in the absence of a responsive state, in the absence of being able to rightfully make a claim mm -hmm. and see that claim met by, by government, uh, um, people will resort to informality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's a low level yeah. equilibrium because in the end, um, it's it's very suboptimal, right? Uh, so the, the 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 way slums in Delhi get water, for example, you know, they're constantly negotiating. They never know how much water they're going to get. And of course, the, the the women have to wait around all day for the tanker trucks to arrive, or, or or wait for the pipes to actually deliver water. And so, yes, they get things through their brokers and by mobilizing, et cetera. But what they're getting is still incredibly suboptimal, right? So. Yes, we have to recognize that informality can be very democratic and in the short term resolves problems that the state, because of lack of capacity or accountability, is failing to resolve. But that doesn't take away the point that in a more, you know, the ideal is still uh, rights-based democratic accountability. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, Manjula has raised her hand. Manjula, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Patrick, for this nice uh, lecture. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, this uh, with the increased urbanization, transport is also one of the important issue at, in addition to the water and then the sanitation. Uh, so have you also looked at uh, that important aspect I wanted to know? And the second thing is that, and I can speak for Karnataka context, that Karnataka is now doing several like reforms to improve the governance, especially they are moving towards dig digitalization or e-governance to streamline uh, I mean, to address this coordination failure and things of that kind. So I don't know to what extent the similar thing is done in Brazil. So I'm not so aware about Delhi, but then, uh, so you do, you, do you also see anything that thing happening in uh, other countries where you have worked here? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. No, I, you're, I, you know, I, I used, I used the examples of sanitation and water delivery in part because they're so basic and fundamental in part because they're easier to measure. You know, transport is really complicated. You have different kinds of transport, there's trade-offs. You know, do you, do you build metros or do you invest in buses? How do you integrate the different systems, et cetera? But you're absolutely right. I mean, mobility um, is, is a, a huge challenge, especially for the urban poor. And, you know, increasingly, obviously, we have to think about uh, climate resiliency and climate adaptation. And maybe the single most important strategy that any city can follow in, in preparing itself for the challenges of climate change is improving transport systems, right? And, and discouraging people from using automobiles and, and, and investing in, in public transportation. And, but here again, 
you know, we're confronted with massive coordination problems. Um, and, you know, good transport systems are systems that are co-produced. They're co-produced with the users of transportation, right? And within India, I don't really see, you know, many successful initiatives when it comes to public transportation. Um, Brazil is famous for, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the city of Curitiba introduced a, a, rapid, a rapid bus transit. Um, and uh, Sao Paulo today has an integrated fare-based system for all of its public transportation. And again, these were, these were in forms of coordination that were achieved through cooperation with civil society organizations. So, yeah, and then on e-governance and using IT, I'm, to be honest, I, you know, I don't think it's about technologies. I mean, I, I think, you know, technologies can serve uh, participation and democracy. Technologies can also be sources of increasing inequality and the digital divide. I mean, think about, you know, the impact of two years of online learning during the pandemic in India. I mean, in our surveys in slums, it's really clear that in the slums, nobody did any online learning at all, right? So if anything, the digital divide has grown over the past two years. So, you know, I'm all for uh, innovative, effective uh, technologies that can make it easier for citizens to engage the state. And I know, you know, Janagraha and other civil society organizations have made a lot of progress there in cities like Bangalore. But again, it's, it's always subject to the social and political conditions under which those technologies are being deployed, right? So I, I just want to caution against just assuming that the introduction of technologies in and of themselves will uh, improve the nature of democratic accountability. Thank you, Patrick. Patrick, we've reached the end uh, time, but there's, we'll just take one last question and we'll close. There's a, there's a student right here on the right, Shubhendra. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, talk. So my question is like, uh, in India, where the civil society is mostly dominated by middle and upper class. So at the same time, uh, the social movements have very strong uh, strong influence in the uh, role of service providing in cities or even in the rural areas also. So, but like if we see the uh, like the uh, current situation in the pandemic situation, where especially the migrant laborer from the cities, uh, nobody talk about them. No civil society came uh, for came for came came to provide service for them or some uh, talk about them. But what's your view in the role of civil society in providing service for particularly uh, to the underprivileged group? Yeah, you know, as, as I said um, in, in the talk, um, ideally uh, civil society, a strong, vibrant civil society helps balance out um, the, the bureaucratic legal elements of the state and the purely political elements of the state. Uh, empirically, of course, you know, civil society um, is, is ultimately rooted in society itself and often reflects the inequities of society. And in urban India, the, the most organized civil society groups tend to be a middle and upper middle class groups, so the RWAs or the planned colonies or so-called environmental groups that are more interested in, in protecting and, and um, um, privileged spaces and, and removing hawkers, et cetera. You know, on the other hand, uh, you, I do think um, in every Indian city, there are uh, middle-class led civil society organizations that are rooted in uh, poor communities and that represent the, the rights of, of subordinate populations. And so, the, you know, I, I, ultimately this is an empirical question, right? Um, but it is striking to me and I, I really think this, and this is something I've been writing about um, and, and I think needs to be um, um, addressed um, um, in, in greater depth. But I do think during the UPA government, you know, the passage of NREGA, the RTI, the right to food, you know, these were middle-class activists, former IS officers, right? Um, Jean Drez, and a, a famous economist. Um, and yet they were clearly aligned with social movements like the MKSS and, and other such movements. And, you know, every civil society organization tends to be led by, quote, middle class people. The question is, are they defending middle class interests or are they actually organically linked uh, to subaltern groups? And as I said, that's ultimately an empirical question. 
Thank you, Patrick. Um, that's a nice note, I think, to close this uh, the lecture session. Thank you so much again, Patrick, for delivering the talk. Um, thank you all for being with us, the audience. Um, and a quick word of thanks to Safish Kamath, who has provided the tech support the whole time. And uh, Professor Hashekar for being with us. For, uh, yes, thanks again, Patrick. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chanda. And it's Thank been you. an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much, Patrick, for this wonderful lecture. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs>